It's time for the great and extravagant setup. Bells and pomegranates. Bells and pomegranates. And how <laughs> did ancient Israel view the universe? All of that and more coming up next on Quick Study. Stay there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And I'm Corey. And you have tuned in to the Quick Study television program. Now, the reason it's called Quick Study is because we go through the Bible in one year. So when you assign the entire 66 books and all of their chapters to one year, you do two or three chapters a day, and it is a quick study. But thank you for joining us, and we want to invite you to stay with us for the next few minutes. We are in the end of Exodus. Now, one of the things we're going to be talking about is the setup, the final setup of the temple, where everything is placed, how it's there. And there'll be a sort of a, a consecration of it and a dropping of the glory of God in it. We're going to talk all about that and more as we continue. Corey, you have Bible archaeology on deck. Yes. What's up? Well, we're talking about lots of things. The sun, the moon, the universe, the temple, the tabernacle. You're covering the whole deal. Yes. That's like the entire <laughs> macroverse going on there. Yeah. Everything except the, the you know the little cells and all well, that. We won't, that would take too long. Okay, to, I got it. So right. a separate show. Separate. Very good. It's going to be interesting anyway. Very good. All right. Now, what's our Bible IQ question, Janice? The robe of the ephod had a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate all around the hem. What were the bells made of? Silver, gold, or bronze? A bell and a pomegranate. Mm -hmm. A bell and a pomegranate. All the way around. The priests wore bells, so you could hear them coming. That's right. You could also hear them moving around in the Holy of Holies, make sure God didn't kill them because they accidentally touched the ark. That and more. Stay there. The Geneva Bible, published in Switzerland, was the Bible of English exiles. Those who desired to escape the tyranny of the kings and the queens of England used this translation, which was a revision from earlier English Bibles. This was the first English Bible in which scholars translated the Old Testament directly from the original Hebrew language. During this time, Biblical Hebrew was being revived from the ancient past. The first colony of exiles from England came to America with the Geneva Bible. Chapter 38, we read about the finishing of the tabernacle, the tent of meeting. And it's a very exciting time for Israel. They finally have a place where they can worship. And God has given them uh, different commandments and ordinances, a way to worship Him. So it's really the beginning of them as a nation. So it's a very exciting time. Now, it might help us in our understanding of the Bible and of ancient Israel to look at the, the predominant culture of the day. There are a whole bunch of little cultures, but they, they all had some things in common. So you and I right now are going to take a look at the sun and the moon, the greater light and the lesser light, and see how this influenced the ancient people and uh, adversely uh, ancient Israel as well. The sun and the moon have long been associated with pagan gods and goddesses. The concept of the sun governing the day, then disappearing at night and reappearing for its rotation in the morning, pricked the deep longings of men. It satisfied their need for a powerful protector or overseer. In the ancient Near East, 
The predominant idea was that the sun god ruled over Earth by day and by night passed through the underworld, a seeing, a knowing god. They called it Shemesh, sun god of justice. The moon god, earlier called Urea and later Sin of Haran, was represented by a crescent moon and tassels. This symbol has been found all over the Middle East, among many different people groups. The worship of the sun and moon as gods is mentioned in the Bible and condemned as idolatry, spoken of as unfaithfulness to the true God. One such mention is in the book of Job. Job speaks of men being secretly enticed by the pagan practices and kissing their hands to the pagan gods, an act of denying Yahweh, the God of the Bible. The final assembly of the Worship Center for the Nation of Israel is constructed and refined. As we studied today in chapter 38, this covers the making of the altar, the bronze laver, the court of the tabernacle, and all of its materials. Chapter 39 covers the making of the garments of the priesthood, along with the ephod and the fascinating breastplate for the priest. Chapter 40 provides the instructions for the setup of a very different worship center than the Egyptian board Israelites were actually used to. Exodus 40, verses 1 through 11. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, On the first day of the first month you shall set up the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. You shall put in it the ark of the testimony and partition off the ark with the veil. You shall bring in the table and arrange the things that are to be set in order on it. And you shall bring in the lampstand and light its lamps. You shall also set the altar of gold for the incense before the Ark of the Testimony and put up the screen for the door of the tabernacle. Then you shall set the altar of the burnt offering before the door of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. And you shall set the laver between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar and put water in it. You shall set up the court all around and hang up the screen at the court gate. And you shall take the anointing oil, and anoint the tabernacle and all that is in it. And you shall hallow it, and all its utensils, and it shall be holy. You shall anoint the altar of the burnt offering, and all its utensils, and consecrate the altar. The altar shall be most holy. And you shall anoint the laver and its base, and consecrate it. Exodus chapter 40, verses 1 through 11. Times and Places. As we focus on these last chapters of Exodus, we learn some interesting things. Now remember that Paul the Apostle tells the church at Corinth that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now the images of order and care in the setup of the tabernacle of God leap out at us with profound meaning when we think about that scripture. When we come to Christ, our mind, our soul, and our body become sacred temples to the Lord. So the Christian is commanded to keep himself from the ideas that our senses are to be exploited for personal pleasure. Our senses are to be used for the worship of God and the understanding and development of His covenants in this world. Our senses and the facilities that God gives us are not designed for us to simply expend like disposable income. Now again, this, this idea comes from the Bible. It doesn't come from the thoughts of man. But you see, if there is no God, then you can do whatever you want to with your body. But if you are accountable to God, and there is a God, and you have a higher purpose, well, then you become more disciplined as a person if you really believe that. Speaking of discipline, as we focus on what is happening here, there are some scriptures and some truths to live by that we can apply today that leap out at us from Exodus chapter 40. 
Now, what I'd like to do is bring you three truths to live by, beginning by showing you the scriptures and reading them to you, and then offer them for your consideration where you are with what you have. Here is the scripture from Exodus 40, verses 1 to 2. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, On the first day of the month, on the, you shall set up the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. When we are born again, or rather when we are born again, I should say, we must reset our lives by God's clock. So in other words, God says to Moses, I want to set your time. I, on the first day of the first year, the first month, I want to set your time, reset your time. Now what happens when we become born again is we surrender ourselves to Jesus Christ. And so when we are born again, God requires and desires, and the only way we're going to be uh, properly able to serve God is if, beloved, you and I reset our lifestyles, reset what's important to us in time and space. You see, many people struggle in their Christian life because they have never reset their time and their space to that which God desires. Now, that's very important. But it's interesting that you see that principle right here in Exodus chapter 40. Now, let's go to verse 3. It says, You shall put the ark of the testimony and the partition and partition of the ark with the sacred veil. Now, here's the second truth to live by. Our hearts are not a recreation room. They must be reserved exclusively for God and protected from outside influences. See, here's the point. In the tabernacle, which Paul calls us on this side of the cross, you know, we are the temple of God, we're the tabernacle. At the very center was this room, and in this room was the Ark of the Covenant. It was so special. It was so sacred that no one was allowed to go in that ark. It was not a public place. It was veiled off. It was to be protected from all of the outside influences and all of the noise of the flesh. And so this represents the heart of the temple. It is the place where God is seated on the throne. It's interesting that the top of the Ark of the Covenant is called the mercy seat. And so the Bible says in Proverbs 3, do not let truth and mercy forsake you. Wrap them around your neck. When I put something around my neck, it thaws right over my heart. Now here's my point. As believers in Jesus Christ, when we give our heart to God, we are not to give our heart to any other thing except God. And so may I just gently ask you a question. Who are you giving your heart to? Are you dating someone who does not have the same values you do? Are you giving your heart to all kinds of entertainment that is taking you away from the principles of God? You're giving your heart away. And the Bible tells us, even in the principle of Exodus 40, to keep your heart with all diligence, Proverbs says, for out of it are the issues of life. And we see that principle right here in the ancient temple. Now let's look at verses 5 and 6 of Exodus 40. It says, You shall also set the altar of gold for the incense before the ark of the testimony and put up a screen for the door of the tabernacle. Then you shall set the altar of the burnt offering before, right there at the door of the tabernacle, the tent of meeting. Put it right there so you can't get in without going through the sacrifice. This brings us to truth to live by, number three. God's power and His holiness are inaccessible without the sacrifice of total surrender. See, if you were to come into the temple, if you were to bring your sacrifices and, and align yourself with God in the temple, it required the sacrifices. It required you to go through that process of repentance before you had access to the power of God. These principles scream out at us from Exodus chapter 40, the first, through, uh, first uh, five verses and six verses. And so today, may we hear the word of God as it speaks to our personal lives. And may we take to heart these principles coming from the brilliantly constructed Old Testament.
In Exodus chapter 38, we have the completion of the tabernacle or the tent of meeting. Now, we're separated by time and culture from ancient Israel, so you and I are going to travel back and take a look at how they might have seen the tabernacle. The book of Genesis claims to be a compilation of written records kept by the early generations of man. The histories in Genesis were presumably written and passed down through the family of Adam by his son Seth, and then from Noah's son Shem down through Abraham until they reached Moses. The first few chapters of Genesis discuss the creation of the universe, mankind, and his purpose. But Genesis is not alone in this. Some of the most ancient non-biblical records contain creation mythology. There are intriguing similarities and differences. In both the pagan beliefs and Genesis, creation is initiated by the spoken decrees of a god. The beginning form of the earth is dark and filled with water, and dirt is an ingredient in humanity. Generally, in pagan beliefs, there is one god who oversees the creation process. But unlike Genesis, the pagan stories also have many other gods. They commonly render creation as being the result of a war of the gods or the death of a god. Also, there are gods who are personifications of nature, like the sun, moon, earth, water, or sky. Whereas in Genesis, these are simply physical properties of the earth and universe. An important difference is the purpose of creation. In Genesis, man is the center. Creation is directed towards providing for humans and installing humankind to represent God to creation. Well, in the pagan accounts, this is the opposite. Man is created to serve the gods, providing for their physical needs. If Genesis were an accurate ancient account, we would expect it to have some similarities with the oldest traditions of humanity, but to have important distinctions as well. And that's exactly what we find. Join Janice, Corey, and Rod Hembry live every Sunday night at 8.30 p.m. for the Bible Investigators Program. We take your questions from Facebook, from Twitter, and also from the chat room about God, the Bible, and the church. Study for Truth with God's Word, Sunday nights live at Bible Investigators. That's BibleDiscoveryTV.com, 8.30 p.m. Eastern on Bible Investigators. Join us. Over one-third of the Bible is prophecy. The 66 books of the Bible have a perfect record of prophecies fulfilled. But what does the Bible say about the immediate future of the world? And what about the future of Israel? Does the recent rash of birds falling out of the sky, millions of dead fish, and cattle dying have any significance according to the Bible? Join Rod Hembry in his compelling two-set audio CD series called The Coming Storm. This set is a fascinating Bible study on the complexion of the coming one world empire, the rescue of Israel, and the mysterious disappearance of the church, all predicted from the pages of the Holy Scripture. Call or write today for your copy of the Coming Storm Bible Study on Near Future and End of Time with Rod Hembry. When you write or call, please remember that Quick Study is viewer supported, and we need your help to continue teaching through God's Word. Suggested donation is $25, and to receive your copy of The Coming Storm, write to P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2, or P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 1566801501. You can also use the Internet, or you can call and talk to someone in the office. Call today, write today, and get your copy of The Coming Storm.
strange but true. Places, places, people. Ancient scribes record amazing truth. Ancient scribes record amazing truth. Flags from different cultures around the world all have the same emblems. The flag of the country of Wales is a dragon. In China and Japan, dragons are revered as their pictures are found throughout both cultures. The many references to dragons in the Bible, as well as early recorded traditions of most nations in antiquity, certainly can't be shrugged off as mere fairy tales. Most probably represent real history of dragons or dinosaurs encountering man before they became extinct. This is consistent with the Genesis record. of God to his people are to love the Lord with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your might or strength. Like the tabernacle designed by God, there are three parts to making the worship of God real. Of course, there's the heart represented by the most holy place. It is where the presence of God is and must stay. And then there's the soul represented by the holy place where God interacts with the procedures of man. And then there's the might or the flesh represented by the tabernacle courtyard where God's holiness confronts the natural flesh. You know, these patterns, Janice, are everywhere in the offerings. Between the takes, we were talking about it. And what's interesting to me is just how much uh, all the, the patterns match the procedures of God and the procedures match the patterns of God. It's absolutely stunning. Brings a whole new meaning when we read the book of Hebrews, Corey. It really does. And one of the things I wanted to ask you, Janice, is when you look, you've read through these procedures. Mm -hmm. You've read through, actually, you know, what the priests wear and so on. What do you think of? What, I mean, when you're reading this, uh, don't you get bored? No. No, I don't. In fact, I'm fascinated by the order and the detail in which it's given. It was very specific. And I oftentimes find myself... Uh, feeling badly for these priests having to train and learn how to do these procedures in the, in the right way and so thankful that we are no longer uh, required to, to make these kinds of sacrifices. Well, it's, it's true. We're required in our heart mm -hmm. as, as pastors and teachers in the church, uh, we are required to make sure we tend to those things in our heart. Yes. The detail and the discipline required of the ministry of the Word of God and the ministry of prayer is absolutely paramount to successful leadership. True. Without revelation from the Word of God, there's no point in teaching. Mm -hmm. Without daily revelation in prayer, there's no point in preaching. And so it's something that we, you know, we really should pay attention to. Now, Corey, mm -hmm. uh, we have a question, and I'm going to get you to help me answer the question. Okay, I will try my best Are to you help sure you out. Are you ready for the question? I think so. It's intense. I think so. All right, here we go. This one isn't too bad. Okay. The robe of the ephod had a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate all around the hem. What were the bells made of? Silver, gold, or bronze? Well, first of all, what's striking here to me is they're wearing sound, sounding bells. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. fascinating to me. What do you think, Corey? You know what? I'm not exactly sure on this. I would guess silver, but mm. it's, I'm, I don't know <laughs> now. <laughs> bells so. of silver or bells of, what were our choices? Uh, there was gold, silver, or bronze. I okay. would guess silver. You're guessing silver? I'm going to guess gold. All right. Here's the right answer from Exodus 39, verse 25, gold. Yeah. Bells of gold. Good guess, though. Pure gold. Good guess, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, gold is associated with the most holiness of God. Yes. Uh, but it, to me, it's an image of, of God bestowing his holiness gracefully upon the priest who would be with him. A very, very interesting. And by the way, you can understand now why... Uh, there were so many Levites around, but notice that the military was not guarding the gold, God's gold. That was assumed mm -hmm. that it was there. So when later on, when Shishak came in, 
one of the things they would have taken would be the priest's garments because it had bells of gold mm -hmm. on it. Very interesting. Yeah. All right, I want to go uh, right to the today's meditation right. and memory. Here it is, Janice. Exodus 40, verses 32 and 33. Whenever they went into the tabernacle of meeting, and when they came near the altar, they washed as the Lord had commanded Moses. And he raised up the court all around the tabernacle and the altar, and hung up the screen of the court gate. So Moses finished the work. You know, I think as we look at the scripture, uh, they, they were not only to be dressed a certain way, but they were to be prepared and washed. Now that idea of the fear of God has somehow leaked out of our understanding and our theology core mm -hmm. in today's world of, I don't know, feel good values and do-it-yourself religion. The, where's the fear of God? It doesn't seem to be there. It, it, sometimes to the degree where there is almost no respect of uh, the Holy Spirit either. It's more of an entertainment value mm -hmm. uh, to the Holy Spirit and God, which is just which is just shocking and awful when you actually read through the Bible and, and recognize the holiness of God. You know, it's one of the one of the things that we learn as we go through the book of Leviticus that the fear of God is a good thing. Honor, respect, duty, these are good things. They're not things to be shunned. Here's watch and pray. principles of atonement are positioned carefully throughout the scripture, all throughout the scripture. What it means is that because we are in a fallen condition, because sin is in this world, somebody did something about it. Somebody atoned for our sin, and that somebody is Jesus Christ. Now, as we end the quick study program today, I simply want to encourage you to get to know him. Maybe he's not who you think he is. He's as close as the mention of his name. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door of your heart and knock. And any man who opens that door, I will come in. Did you know that's his promise? That's a promise of the God of the universe. Now, if you're serious today about finding the Lord, then reach out to Jesus Christ and say, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross and rose again, that my sin might be taken away and I can have eternal life. And I make you Lord of my life now. Show me who God is. He will respond if you're serious. Thank you for joining us today on the Quick Study television program. Remember, we're viewer supported. Would you pray about supporting this program? We send our Bible guide to those who support on a regular basis. Also, remember, tomorrow on Quick Study, how we give determines how we live, and how we live determines how we give. Join us.